Welcome to Inspiring End of Life Conversations with Nina Impala. Do you have questions about death? How about events surrounding death? Or perhaps you have questions that need to be answered after death. On this program, we talk frankly and openly about the subject and invite you to share your comments and experiences as well. Now, here is your host, Nina Impala. Hello and welcome back to Inspiring End of Life Conversations. And if it's your first time with us, we welcome you. Today, I am here with one of my most favorite people that come onto my show, Father Nathan, every third Wednesday of the month. And we are going to be talking about his new book today. It's going to be great. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him before we get started. Nathan ha- Nathan Castle has been a Catholic priest of the semi-contemplative Dominican order since 1979. Father Nathan has served as a campus minister of Arizona State University, the University of California, Riverside, and Stanford University. Currently, he lives in the community of the Dominican men and women serving the University of Arizona in Tucson. Father Nathan has prayed for diseased souls since childhood and has helped stuck and not so stuck cross for more than 23 years. After Life Interrupted 2 is his latest and third book. He has used his first book and he has his, he has another book. His first book is called Antoto 2. Sorry, my lips got tangled up there. The Wizard of Oz is a spiritual adventure as the basis for healing trauma. He does retreats for spiritual groups and survivors of natural disasters. Father Nathan is available for speaking engagements and retreats. And you can always find him on his website at nathan-castle.com. So welcome to the show, Father Nathan. Great to be with you. I'm glad you're here. We are going to be talking uh, about uh, Afterlife Interrupted Book 2. And today, I want to start with a quote that I found in the beginning of this book, which I think is, this quote really kind of goes along with what's happening now, but also we're going to be speaking about this on a deeper level, and it's from Thomas Aquinas. He says, we must love them both, those whose opinions we share and those whose opinions we reject, for both have labored in the search for truth and both have helped us in the finding of it. So, when I opened your book, Father Nathan, and I read this quote, it it spoke to my heart about us finding our way in this world. And with the work that you do, tell me what this quote means to you and this beautiful book that has just come out. Well, I think the whole universe is made of love and God is love. Everything that came into existence has God all over it. And that includes people who have opinions that you uh, disagree with, maybe even vehemently disagree with. Mm -hmm. It's important to keep in mind that that person is a uh, a being made of love who disagrees with you. And and you might even have some basis for saying they're even objectively incorrect in their opinion, but that doesn't mean that you have to make of them an opponent or an enemy. Right. And in, in your work that you do with the souls that have died traumatically, how does this apply to them? And how has it affected you? Because I know Thomas Aquinas is somebody that you very much admire, and I've heard you quote him before. So I'm really curious about like when you're doing this work, how, you know, does it feel like you've had to learn more to be a really good listener, to not be judgmental in any regard whatsoever, and just be present, regardless of what's happening? Wouldn't that be nice to be, to never be judgmental ever? (laughs) <laughs> do, you, oh God. do you know anybody like that? You know, I don't know if our human brains can actually do that, Father Nathan. <laughs> well, it's it's worth trying to do. It is. It's true, and yes, I do try. And uh, and I I do make myself uh, try to do that. Well, both people who are stuck uh, or in some way after their death, their sudden deaths. Uh, confused, um, unhappy. There usually is some thing in their thinking that, that 
Thinking often drives emotions and emotions can often get us entangled. And that doesn't, your emotions and your thoughts don't go away when your consciousness leaves the body. You're okay. still with thoughts and feelings and, and emotions that flow from stories you tell yourself. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of times in counseling, counseling people alive on this plane or people on the next plane, yeah. uh, it, it just involves good listening and it listening does. for fallacies where people are saying something to themselves that might not be true, mm. but they're believing it's true. And it's causing them suffering as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know much about law except, you know, courtroom dramas on TV but yeah. you know that phrase, uh, well, someone will object and say that's a fact, not in evidence. Okay. Okay. Sometimes people will assert a thing. Do you remember being in college and writing a paper and claiming something and then not footnoting it? Yes. You know, not citing a source? Yes. It's like making something up. On whose authority do you say that, Nina? Okay. And we do that to ourselves. We'll just create stories in our mind sometimes and come to the conclusion that it's right. And lots of times it's ego. It's right because I said it's right. If I said it, it must be right. <laughs> Our right. ego behave that way. No, and, that makes sense. And, or it, sometimes we'll we'll get some little coterie of of, uh, of people around us who will agree with us even when we're um, believing something false. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, man, just so much sadness comes out of all that. Uh, so on top of that, what I read and what I got is that all of us are wanting to belong somehow. Yeah. That's deep. Mm -hmm. You know, if you really think about it. And, you know, as I was reading through the book, and actually I was thinking about people that have lost loved ones. So the survivors that are here. And with one of your gals, gosh, who was it? The one that her husband died. Is that Wilhelmina? No. Wilhelmina, yes. Whose, whose husband, Eric, died suddenly in front of her. Right. But yeah. she didn't have a traumatic death. But what I got from that, being a grief counselor, is that she didn't know who she was and at all without him, gave up, and did not have any sense of belonging at all. And yeah. that's what maybe she was looking for. And it it seems like it's kind of a theme through all of the stuck souls. It's like, how do I fit in? How do I belong? Trying to figure it all out. And I think we kind of do that in life too. Yeah. Well, of course, all the ones that I deal with died sudden traumatic deaths. Right. So they didn't have the opportunity that um, an illness that has a sort of a timeline to it. A beginning and an end. Might afford, you know. Yeah. When people get a, a terminal diagnosis and mm -hmm. they know that they're supposed to get their affairs in order. Correct. Uh, people that I deal with don't have that luxury, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. uh, they just are, go from alert to out of body and dead and gone <laughs> and in the yeah. afterlife all at once. Mm -hmm. and so that can be a lot to absorb. And, and some of them have, um, you know, have created stories about the way that they died that don't help them after they die. Yeah. So as human beings, seeking wholeness kind of, it's, it's not only in this life and most that don't die traumatic deaths, you know, they go to the light. We've heard it from the near death experiencers, but the other people are really looking for a way to fit in. And I think what I love that you did in the book, maybe you could talk a little to this, is a lot of the stories you really tried to make relatable so people do feel like they belong. But these are things that happen in the world, like some of your stories about the fire. Yes. And stories about suicide. Mm -hmm. And these are all stories that when I was reading, I really felt that that sense of wanting to belong, not being judgmental and just trying to help them figure out what do I do now? Where do I go now? Which is very common and with grief anyways. I know after my own mom died and still I struggle with it sometimes of feeling like I don't belong here because I was with her. And it's that separation and that detachment that makes you feel that you really need to, oh, 
I don't know, just kind of figure it out. It, just figure out where you belong. Do you know what I'm saying? It's it's almost like you feel kind of suspended, I, I could say. Kind of like when people are on the other side. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, belonging uh, is kind of uh, close to... Um, uh, you you recently became a wife. Does your audience know that? Yes. Uh, how long have you been a wife? Two months. Two months. Um, I used to do lots of weddings because I was a campus minister and lots of people meet their oh, spouse yeah. during their college years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I also worked at places, two places that were very attractive wedding venues. And so got kind of more than the normal uh, run of, of weddings. And I love words. And I, so I studied well, uh, the words husband and wife. Okay. Husband comes from animal husbandry. It means to care for a living thing carefully so that it can grow and thrive. Right. Um, my brother studied animal husbandry. Mm-hmm. Uh, wife comes from the, the idea of the woman being the belonging, the possession of a man. Yes. Mm-hmm. I see what you're saying. Which on the one hand, you know, can sound offensive to contemporary ears in that women don't want to be under the thumb mm-hmm. and thought of as the baggage, you know, just one more thing a man owns. On the other hand, on Valentine's Day, the most iconic little candy heart says, be mine. Yeah, that's exactly right. We want to belong to another. something. Yeah, and to know that someone thinks of us as their own. And I believe that about God, that God, we didn't roll off an assembly line. We were each handcrafted, we're each one of a kind, knit together in our mother's womb. And we each belong here because we were placed here by a mm-hmm. creator who wanted us to be here. Mm-hmm. And we might have to fight in our psyche to yeah. hold on to that truth, especially if people in circumstances give us mm-hmm. messages that we don't belong. We're not wanted here. Get the hell mm-hmm. out of here. Something like that. Um, but we radically do belong here. All of us. That's important for people to hear. And by putting, you know, in the book where you put that you want people to be able to relate to some of these stories and, With all of us, you know, I know myself included, if I read something, I'm like, yeah, I went through that too. Or, you know, if you hurt your back or you broke your leg or whatever it is, or you went through cancer, you know, you've got people that give you a sense of belonging to something. It's just so interesting to me, you know, Father Nathan, because I hadn't really thought about it this way. But it's, it's very true about people and the way that they feel. And looking to, I mean, when you look at social media and all these different things where we're posting and looking for people that are having the same experience or that happened to me, it's all about that connectivity. Yes. It's beautiful. And the book does that. I'm glad you say that because that was one of our goals in in the writing of it. I I was on the road working in uh, February and March, which is what I do preaching and retreats and things. Right. And the pandemic shut all that down and, you know, in no time at all. Yes. But that opened a door for me to write another book. It did. And, and because of the context, we, we, my sister and I, who was my primary editor, looked at what, what does the world need that we can offer it right now? That's correct. In, the, in our stories. And so we looked around at the, the pandemic and uh, yeah. the clash over racial stuff and police and uh, wildfires. Um, we, we, we included a lot of stories that we felt like are kind of, you know, right in the headlines. That where might people be. can feel, you know, where they can read it and maybe find some comfort. Yeah. And then we, we included a couple of suicide stories because the previous book didn't have a suicide in it. No, and I think it's really important right now. And I want to um, go into a little bit more detail about that after the break. Um, yeah. I just think it'd be a really good thing to talk about because I don't know. I just know, I mean, with the pandemic, we might as well always talk about this until it's over because it's a, it's a thing, you know, that's happening right now. And it's people have lost their connectivity. Mm-hmm. They've lost where their place, whether it's at a job or things have really changed drastically at home 
or money or all these different things that make us feel, you know, it's just like, it's, it's like the everyday life, simple stuff that you just do that's gone now that maybe did feel me like you belonged, you know, even going to a store or running out to your favorite place where you like to go shopping or boutique or something like that. In fact, we, we went out to a jewelry store uh, yesterday and it, and we wanted to go to the little guy, not the big one. We wanted to go to the little guy because we knew how much he needed to have people coming into his store because of, you know, his connection, wanting to belong and wanting to keep going. So you you could just really go into detail on this quite a bit. You really can. And hopefully we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we get back from the break. And I'd like to touch on that some more. Okay. Okay. All right. We will be right back. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Nina offers an alternative to traditional counseling. Sessions are not just 50 minutes, but a full hour. When you go in for a regular counseling session, many times you don't remember everything. Nina's Difference is a summary email after each session and or a follow-up phone call if needed up to two weeks after. Nina also provides hospital visit consultations as necessary. Sessions with Nina and Paula are $250. And if you book a three-session package, you will get a $100 discount. Let's get you feeling peaceful and happy again. Losing someone we love is one of the most challenging, fearful, and heart-rending experiences we are ever likely to face. In her book, Dearly Departed, Nina Impala shares stories of her experiences as a hospice volunteer for more than 12 years and how those experiences prepared her for the final days of her own parents. Nina emphasizes the importance of being a good listener and living a good life. Dearly Departed by Nina Impala is available in paperback or Kindle edition through Amazon.com or your favorite book retailer. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Inspiring End of Life Conversations. If you have a question for Nina Impala or her guest today, call into our program at 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Or send an email to tutoringforthespirit at gmail.com. Now, back to this week's program. And we're back with Father Nathan. We are talking about his new book, Afterlife Interrupted 2. So welcome back, Father Nathan. And um, well, we were talking a little bit, uh, well, we're talking to about suicide. And I heard something the other day, it said it was up 600%. That's a lot. But I think a lot of it is from people probably using drugs more than normal because of depression and not feeling connected. And uh, let's talk to that for a little bit. Well, in the choosing of stories, I have probably about 300 to pick from. Oh, wow. So when it comes to, cho- we chose 13 for each of these two books. How many do you get a week, Father Nathan? Like people come one, up through? One or two per week. Per week. Yeah. I spent the whole day today just going over uh, recorded transcripts and cleaning them up and filing them for Wow. So when it happens, you know, do you, I mean, is that like part of your regime every morning to just get up and write them down or try and remember them? That's when I'm at my best. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sometimes I wrote two down this morning, one of them, which happened last night. And one of them was about three days ago, but I kept refreshing it in my mind so that when I did sit down to write it down, I'd have enough of the detail. to get. That's a pretty big feat. 
to be able, you know, that's every morning. I figured it figured it's probably something that happens like all the time for you. And we don't know that. We just see what's in your book, but you said like 300 and there's 13 in the book. So <laughs> it's kind of a lot, you know? It is. Um, and today I had a, a day that was largely uninterrupted. I'm sort that's of good. on retreat. And so I've spent the entire day doing this work, which is uncommon for me because I have a lot of other responsibilities. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we were talking about suicide and when I, when I have, especially when I used to be able to be in front of groups before COVID yeah. uh, would be talking on this topic, suicide would almost always come up near the end of a session, often by somebody in the back, raising their hand in an unique voice, inquiring about suicide. And almost always it was somebody that had lost a child to suicide or a yes. neighbor or someone close to them. Because the thoughts are really scary that people have when someone dies of suicide. It's so perplexing. Um, yes. And for people that are trained in, you know, in a religious tradition, some of the religious traditions, including the Catholic one that I'm a member of, has a spotty history of how to even think about it. Yeah. You know, people were, when I was younger, uh, the church's practice was to say that the last thing that person had done was commit a mortal sin by committing yeah. murder against themselves. And so they couldn't have a Catholic funeral and couldn't be buried in a Catholic cemetery and so on. Well, that changed, you know, in 1990, 1991, there was an, a new uh, prayer book that came out that included prayers for people at, you know, who had, had taken their own lives. Um, but anyway, the, the, that question comes up all the time. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a couple of stories that were uh, people who had taken their lives uh, in their own words about what they what they experienced before uh, and after. Mm -hmm. And so you had a lady that I think you had a story that you were going to share with us about that. Well, one, it, do you mean the ones that are in the book or? Um, no, something recently that came through. We were, we were talking about it on the break a little bit. Um, well, one thing that happens sometimes is that, um, you know, sometimes suicide is quite blatant and obvious. Yeah. Uh, with a note mm -hmm. or an action that is unequivocal. It's absolutely a suicide. Other times it's more subtle. Yeah. Uh, particularly where something like sleeping pills or other, uh, for people that were already struggling with uh, chemical addictions. Right. Taking, uh, overdosing. Mm-hmm. Well, was the overdose intentional or not? And if they're using street drugs that don't have, a, you know, a, a monitored, regulated amount of an active chemical in it, it's sort of a crapshoot. Uh, so sometimes people will die uh, just because they took a drug that was uh, more potent than than the last dosage was. Yes. People don't actually know. A lot of times younger people, well, what I've been hearing is about the fentanyl contact and a lot of the drugs and they're just not they have no idea right. how powerful they are yeah well one of the the one one of the um, recent ones that's come to me she uh, she died of a drug overdose but it was uh, after i think she was in her early 40s and i think she felt like she had exhausted her parents oh. and had, had ruined their golden years with her sagas of you know, needing to be in rehab and, you know, stealing from them and stuff like that. But what she learned that in the afterlife is that she still, she didn't have a chemicals. She didn't have cells in a body that were screaming for a drug. Got it. But she had the fallout of all of the emotional damage done during those, um, you know, addicted years mm -hmm. and what it had done to her relationships and what it had done to her relationship to the truth. And that, because when you, once you're in addiction, it, uh, it has a lot of falsehood built into it. Right. Making up stories. Yeah. Very hard to, to uh, keep a handle on what's actually true. Mm -hmm. And in this case, she said, I'd been in rehab several different times. Mm. And she said, always the meter was running. Mm. There was always some sense of you had to be healed by a certain date, oh. usually because of insurance. Yes. So there was a lot of pressure there. Uh, and she said she went through several kind of graduations from rehab that were really not based upon her 
uh, state of health. Mm-hmm. But we're really kind of wishful thinking on the part of the staff that had to say goodbye to her because she can't stay here any longer. <sighs> so they would sort of have a have a good luck and farewell ceremony uh, for somebody that really wasn't uh, <laughs> wasn't healed. Wow. And she said on after passing, she said that's gone away because everything they do is based on certain knowledge of truth and that the rehabs that she had been here, always people trying to do the best they could, but not always certain of what the root problem was. Yeah. You know, um, much addiction starts with wanting to numb pain. Right. Well, it it might've started with some euphoria, you know, taking something at a party or whatnot, Mm -hmm. but very often moving into addiction covers up some pain that was too difficult to bear. Not wanting to feel is what I always get with people. just don't want to feel. It yes. Just, yeah. It hurts uh, too much to feel. In this woman's case, she found out uh, in the afterlife, her guardian was with her all the time. Oh. And she would say things to herself in the afterlife about her life. And her guardian would pipe up and say, well, Nina, that's your perception of the truth. But remember, I was there and here's what happened. So enter Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> if I could a just say who, that. A person yeah. who could say the truth, and she knew that her guardian loved her and would never want yes. to hurt her mm-hmm. and would say, uh, that's your perception of things, uh, but I was there too, and here's what happened. And she needed to hear that. This is the beauty, you know, of just exactly what we were talking about earlier when someone just listens which is what you do. You're, you're an avid listener for these people. And then being able to just gently and usually pretty subtly offer them something different. Sometimes be- in the form of question. You seem very sure of that statement you just made. Uh-huh. Yeah. You guys are quite skilled at that. <laughs> you really well, are. Um, I've been in therapy a couple of times and I've just tried to pay it forward, you know, do what, what helped me. And yeah. what I found is that lots of times people make, um, create stories, dramatic stories about themselves that sadden them and that are based in a skewed perception of the truth to begin with. Mm-hmm. And if you can just help them s- s- sort out where there might be a, a, you know, a flaw in their logic, sometimes that's enough to set them on a new course. How many suicides have you dealt with in with the afterlife? Um, they're not all that often. I think maybe twenty five out of more than three hundred. Mm-hmm. And they and even in the dreams where they first present their story, they often do it most of the time. Do it in a way that doesn't make it blatantly obvious that it was a suicide. So I know. I was looking here. We had was Leaper Bob one. I can't yes. Remember. Yes. Who now he was, um, he he was one of those guys that actually did uh, during the depression jump out of an office building. You know that's kind of a trite uh, stereotype of those early years of the depression. A lot of men took their lives home by jumping out of buildings. Yeah, three guys, and this guy actually did that. Uh, he didn't give us his real name. He just called himself Leaper. Um, because he jumped out of a uh, out of his office building, but he went on to explain a lot of what happened to him and uh, how uh, he didn't lose his fortune in a day like some people did. But he worked in uh, financial management, and uh, financial managers fell into discredit mm-hmm. after the market collapsed. People didn't have people who had money didn't want to entrust it to, to experts like him. And so his income dried up and he had three small kids and a wife and he felt like the wolf was at the door. He said he felt like he was being squeezed by a boa constrictor. Mm. Um, It got worse and worse. And then he started to drink and he said that of course made everything worse. Mm -hmm. And It just occurred to him one time that he was in an office building that had his office was on the second floor. It had a, kind of retail on the first floor and then a couple of offices of, you know, professional businesses and then several floors of hotel. 
and then on the top, a nice restaurant with a bar. And he said he, it just occurred to him that he could go up to the bar, have a couple of drinks, say goodbye to the city. Uh, you don't have to pay for the hotel room until the morning, but if you're live in the morning, you don't even have to pay. Jeez. Wow. So that's what he did. And that's what he did. Um, but, you know, he found that he survived his death because everybody does. And Picked that, him up. Sorry, uh, I have to ask that question. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, Who brought him over? Um, in the end, that one was... Um, was it B, B, B something, I think? No, no that, was, that was another one. That, uh, it, this might, your listeners might find this hard to believe, but um, John Jacob Astor... That's right. The guy from the Titanic. This was an amazing. The wealthiest man in the world. Yes. The day the Titanic sank with him on it. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, even though 700 and some souls died that in that event, he, his name was in all the papers because people could just hardly believe that something like that could befall the half. The, 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 the Too bad like him. World. Yeah. And he's helped me with other stuff. He's, uh, he's a very famous drowner. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a famous drowner. So other people that got drowned. That this drowned. Is, yeah, and this is another quick wonderful thing about your work. Sorry to interrupt you. Is that they they become friends and they find each other and they help each other. They do, and just like you know, this time of the year, I, I've been watching some TV, and there's a lot of celebrities that are lending their uh, fame to yes. efforts to fill food banks and mm. toys for tots and all of that. It's quite common for people to use their celebrity to do good. Yes. And that doesn't have to stop uh, upon death. Mm -hmm. People that have some celebrity. Of course, one thing that they'll also tell you is, um, you know, I was famous in a certain language and in a certain country, but not universally. Oh, okay. You know, people who are great big deals in, uh, in our country right. are not known in, you know. Another country. In countries, if their art is done in English. Mm -hmm. Very not very often not very well known in other in languages with other in countries with other languages. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but but anyway, he came and he he's worked. Uh, I've seen his work several times before. And one kind thing he said to Leaper, uh, we who eventually took the name Bob because he he had a certain lightness about it, and we decided that a cork Bob's on the water. And that, oh yeah, uh, we he took the name Bob. Uh, but he, uh, John Jacob said to him, well, you know what? Uh, had I lived another couple of decades, I might have been around when the market crashed and I might have found that window ledge as attractive as you did. See, that's interesting. And there's no judgment there. Not at all. No judgment. And that is what's so beautiful because that's the last thing a person needs. That took their the, life. The other story was a, a young woman named B who was a big band singer in oh. that era at the end of the thirties and beginning of the forties. Right. Uh, oh, and often yeah. had one female lead singer and, you know, a whole band full of men. Yeah. She was, uh, she was right off the farm at 18 and put together you know, with this group of men. And before very long, they were taking turns at her in the hotel oh. and she just didn't know what to do and got pregnant by one of them and decided that the way out was um, a pistol. And uh, she said, I took matters into my own hands. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, um, she, she didn't want, she said she would only let me use her story in my book if I didn't add religious shame to it. Oh. And I said, I have no interest in doing any such doing thing. anything about religious shame. Uh, um, and then she said, some of the people here, I thought that some of that, the people that have been helping her, uh, she was afraid that they might shame her too. And mm -hmm. she said, they said to me, none of us uh, went through what you went through. We weren't there to what happened to you, but we're here with you now and we will help you now. And it's that simple. It's just that simple. We didn't experience what you experienced. And it's really not our business. The, our business is to be here now. And we have, uh, we're here because we have uh, healing skills that could help you now. Wow. 
I think that this thought process with suicide is one of the most important lessons that you can give people through this book sometimes. I used to facilitate a group of suicide survivors and it was it was it was humbling to say the least. Mm-hmm. And to think in your brain, you know, and it's it's interesting, and I'm thinking that maybe you have observed the same thing is that when you present or someone reads about suicide in your books that they really can start to see some compassion and love and no judgment around it. Well, there's only two stories and they're there. We, this, the method in these, my two books Mm -hmm. are letting a person speak in their own words. So you can hear their own um, process, their own understanding. um, How loved they were through it. uh, Yes. And how um, they often, they also, uh, they're they're still near the front end of processing things, mm-hmm. and so there's still um, more material to be dealt with. The fact for in in Bob's case that he left a wife and three children who depended upon him, and he said, "Well, that's for later." Yeah, you they just come. handle one part of it, pretty much one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and that's just good therapeutics too. You don't want to have someone uh, it, it, sometimes. Healing needs to happen. Like in the body, the body heals itself from the inside out. If you get a deep cut, your body knows how to send pluripotent stem cells to the site and start recreating that tissue layer upon layer Mm -hmm. in a methodical, orderly way. Right. It's kind of like the journey of grief. Yeah. And and, uh, and like in AA, they won't let you say, I'm never going to touch another drop. You know? Uh, I'm going to, uh, henceforth and forever, I'm not going to be alcoholic. They don't let you do that. They just say one day at a time. Yeah. And that's the really way you have to look at that. And as when you look at grief, and I think with any kind of trauma, you know, and and the thing is in the afterlife, that's what they teach. And whenever, you know, because I get pictures in my head when you talk all the time, but I always feel like this is what they teach. Okay, this is what we're doing right now. They really keep everybody in the present moment, you know, and even... When you talk a lot about some of these stories, it's very interesting how they just they'll they'll they won't take as much time just on the event itself. It seems, Father Nathan, what they do is that most of the thought process is healing, and that's bringing you to present and having being in the present moment. Well, we're here now. This is what we're doing now with Father Nathan, and then we're going to be going to here, and then the next thing but not really staying so long. Who said it on one of them? We got to go to break. I'm going to, I'm going to go to break and then we're going to get back to this one lady. So we'll be right back. Okay. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit facebook.com forward slash voice America. Nina offers an alternative to traditional counseling. Sessions are not just 50 minutes, but a full hour. When you go in for a regular counseling session, many times you don't remember everything. Nina's difference is a summary email after each session and or a follow-up phone call if needed up to two weeks after. Nina also provides hospital visit consultations as necessary. Sessions with Nina and Paula are $250, and if you book a three-session package, you will get a $100 discount. Let's get you feeling peaceful and happy again. Losing someone we love is one of the most challenging, fearful, and heart-rending experiences we are ever likely to face. In her book, Dearly Departed, Nina Impala shares stories of her experiences as a hospice volunteer for more than 12 years and how those experiences prepared her for the final days of her own parents. Nina emphasizes the importance of being a good listener and living a good life. Dearly Departed by Nina Impala is available in paperback or Kindle edition through Amazon.com or your favorite book retailer. 
Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Inspiring End of Life Conversations. If you have a question for Nina Impala or her guest today, call into our program at 1 888 346 9141. That's 1 888 346 9141. Or send an email to tutoringforthespirit at gmail.com. Now, back to this week's program. And we're back with Father Nathan. Thank you for being here. So just before the break, Father Nathan, we were talking about how the guides, the guardians, who's ever there with them, really kind of brings them back into the present moment, doesn't let them linger long with the accident, because it really doesn't matter anymore, that part. And so it keeps them in the present moment. And you you and I were talking about this on the break about, um, we were talking about the lady, um, was it the lady that was on fire? She can get to look at her body or something. That's uh, Lucille. Yeah, name. Lucille. Uh, so, she, uh, go ahead. Well, she died in one of the California wildfires. Okay. And uh, she woke up to, uh, in the middle of the night, to unusual colors out her window. Mm. And thought it was really pretty. And got up to look at it and then realized that she was inside a wildfire. Wow. And uh, she was in her 80s, widowed in her you know, night clothes and slippers and had to assess in, in a moment her circumstance and what to do about it. Yeah. And she thought, well, if I were younger, I'd make a run for it. I'd grab the car keys and go. Mm-hmm. But she said, you know, I don't like my chances in my eighties in slippers on the driveway. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. So it's almost like she kind of got she, to this. Camp. I just called her uh, Lucille calm under fire. Yeah. Uh, because she, she simply assessed the present moment, mm-hmm. said, I don't like any of my options, but sometimes tornadoes and wildfires move through a neighborhood and skip over and leave one house standing. You always see that in the way they cover the news covers those things after the fact. Yes. But, well, there's a chance that maybe my house will be spared. I'll at least have a roof over me. Mm-hmm. And she had two cats. So mm-hmm. she thought, I'll just gather my cats and we'll sit here in the chair and we'll see what happens next. And that's what she did. Yeah. And then she she said, I don't know how wildfires work, but I think I was unconscious before, before flames ever touched me. I think there was nothing left in the air. Yeah. I don't well, know if wildfires either. Can the oxygen burn out of the air before a flame touches a person that's trying to breathe it? Right. That's what she thought. She said, however it works, I never was burned. And she said, I was lifted up and out by my guardian. Mm -hmm. And um, I was made to know that I was safe. I have a question for you. Did did any of the people that you've worked with um, know their guardian before they died? Or did all of them pretty much meet the guardian and realize they had a guardian? Um, maybe once in a while people have a vague notion of it. But um, um, And remember, I'm dealing not with some churchy subset. Just No, you're not. Mm-mm. I'm dealing with, you know, everybody's everything. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, and so, no, Regular most folks. don't know that they had a guardian and they learned of it in that moment. Mm, gotcha. Well, one of the things you said when we were talking uh, about... Oh, a couple different people that what the the guardians do is they focus on the next moment. I like that. The next moment. So in in life here, I find in my own self is when my mind starts to get going because I have struggled a lot lately with just being really too many things are going on in my my brain. And if I bring myself back to, okay, what am I doing right now? Well, I'm talking and doing a live radio show and it's 346 and it's Wednesday. Mm-hmm. That's being very present. 
It is. And then you, um, you know, I'm a multitasker and I incline toward the future. Mm -hmm. My mind races into the future and I have to pull it back into the present. Yeah. Uh, uh, But one of the ways that I stay calm is through, uh, you know, contemplative practice by still and then trying to do the mindfulness of doing Mm -hmm. one thing at a time and doing it well. Mm -hmm. I create a lot of to-do lists and there's always more things on them than I can do in a day. Oh, that's yeah. And, but that's because I have a lot of interests. Yes. you. If I wanted to be interested in fewer things, that's a choice open to me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is a lifestyle I've chosen. Nobody has forced me to be interested in lots of things. Yeah. Uh, uh, But then it's important to me to um, be in the present moment, Mm -hmm. do the present duty, Mm -hmm. breathe in love, breathe out love Mm -hmm. and many things get done. Uh, and, and However they get done. And there's no judgment in any of it. And I would. For heaven's sakes, we're all eternal. You know, we're, we're never going to be finished. Ever. Eternal things are not finished. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we get these ideas in our head and, and of maybe the way things are going to go, maybe the way things should go. There was, um, oh, and I heard about a death the other day. It's just because we've had a lot of deaths period, you know, out in the world and just thinking to myself, you know, thinking about you, thinking about what you write about, and he died rather tragically, that, you know, just praying for his soul, praying for him to be rest rest in peace, which has taken a whole new meeting for me since I've read your books, and the importance of resting in peace, and that everybody deserves that. And I, I even feel, you know, Father Nathan, that that's something that, not that I'm I'm dead here, but just being able to feel peace or be in peace. I guess rest in peace is more of an afterlife term, but attaining that here too. And I think your book teaches that as well. I think if if we can do that, we become a gift to other people, even when we're not conscious of it. Mm. You must have had a few people in your life that were just so at home in their own skin. Yes. So, uh, so at peace in in themselves, mm-hmm. or, and or the people that come up to you and are what I find a lot in my own life is people will just walk up to me and tell me something very deep, mm-hmm. and and I always equate that to me being when I'm when I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and my brain is free. That is my energy, my light, being calm and peaceful, and someone knowing that they are safe with me and they could say whatever it is they need to say and all this. There's there's something that's very attractive about um, a peaceful soul. It's true. That makes you want to come sit by them. Yep. And I think we've all, uh, well, I've experienced that before and I'm sure that you have too, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's just energy and it's what people emit. So, you know, in this conversation about your book and about all these people is that through the work that you do, it kind of teaches all of us that you're reading Father Nathan's books, which I highly recommend, is that it really takes you to te- take a step back and look at your life, what's good in it, what's working in it, what's flowing in it. Well, and one I, way of looking at it is that because these people all die such horrific deaths, mm-hmm. the worst came to the worst and they got hit by a bus, you know, okay. or okay. Mm-hmm. in the blood or whatever. A lot, of, a lot of our anxiety has to do with fears of bad things happening in the future. And then, dang it, for these people, <laughs> it did. <laughs> the, yeah. the worst they could imagine happened. And, oh, my God, they survived it. And that those, gone. So the difference between those people and people that don't feel like they can't go on is that these people are still dealing with fright and anger, would you say, and confusion. Uh, a whole variety of things, but yeah. all, all of the above. Not everybody has all of them, but sure, they're they're moving through whatever, or you know, dislocation, a disappointment, mm-hmm. uh, guilt. Um, one one at the beginning, Brady was this guy that was always planning things, and then he got killed on the way to a baseball game that he had bought the tickets for, and he had made the plans, and mm-hmm. he felt like just because he was a planner, he controlled the future. Wow. Well, he learned in, a, in an instant that he didn't. And he had to reorient himself in the afterlife 
because they were starting to try to get him excited about what he might do next. And he mm-hmm. said, you need to make plans. I don't want to make plans. <laughs> I, just, I just had all my plans ruined by right. a car crash. Mm-hmm. And then his guardian said to him, well, you can, you can decide if you want, that thought will make you unhappy. Mm-hmm. Decide whether you would like to be eternally unhappy. Yeah. Plans. Let me tell you, there's no making plans right now in this world. You know, I mean, literally planning to go out, planning to go on vacation, planning to, you know, whatever there, you know, you can't. And so I think we're all getting some pretty hard lessons right now about being present and being in the present moment, you know. Well, and one of them can be that the place where you're at can be the the center of your activity and being. You can okay. plan to do things from home. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're, aren't you at home right now? Yes, I'm at home right now. Yeah. And if you a radio show from your house, yes, yes, <laughs> and those are that's my, that was my plan for today. Did you even recognize yourself ten years ago? Would you have ever thought you'd be doing a radio show from your house? No, I don't. Didn't ever thought that I'd be doing a radio show from my house. You know, it wasn't something I planned on. It just kind of showed up. Right. And I think that you know, if all of us right now, you know, just in this moment, if we can always bring ourselves back to that. We learn a lot from these souls that have crossed over and their guardians and what what they've brought to us and you and all of your incredible prayer partners that you've had are just, it's, it's amazing. And today we haven't talked any about humor, but when you read the books uh, very often, they're just laugh out loud, funny. Yeah. There's some very funny stuff in it. There really is. And some of the things, um, in fact, I'm just looking at right now the Mar- Margaret Hamilton that came and got. Uh, who did Margaret Hamilton come? Came after the, be the big band singer. Oh, that's right. After the big band singer, and she had quite a laugh. And so, yeah, and they talk about these little little things that they all kind of had when they were here. And going back to what you just talked about was, you know, about being in the present moment and everything. And it's so. Going back to Thomas Aquinas, it is about belonging. So him making all these plans, Brady, making these plans, it 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 kept him safe, but it gave him this sense of belonging to something greater. If I make plans and we have this going on, then I must be a part of this. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good quote to put in your book. So much. And I know we're getting close to the end of the show here, but I I really like that quote a lot. And at the end of it, I'm going to read this one little part. Let me see if I can find it that you and I read after Thomas Aquinas. And I think it would be, it's part of him too. It says, in search for truth, St. Thomas Aquinas taught this, that the search needs to be willing to listen to both extremes along a continuum of opinion because the radical extremist to the right or to the left as a part of the truth that is most clearly expressed there. In order to come to wholeness in the pursuit of truth, we need to have the humility to listen to persons whose ideas might be very unlike our own. And then you added on top of that about maybe giving them that little nudge or that's their perception. Because we were talking about the perception. So this, so what I'm talking about, like the whole show, we had so much to do with the importance of belonging. Mm -hmm. And that importance of belonging, it's what your perception is, what you're looking at, what matters in your life is that gives you that. And you do take it into the afterlife, but I love how they put it all in the present moment. There's so much I could say about your book, Father Nathan, and I don't want (laughs) to, I can't go any further because we only got one minute left. Well, people can find it on Amazon. It went, uh, it went best. It went, it went best new release in, okay. uh, in its category. Oh, fantastic! Uh, it's Afterlife interrupted book two. Okay, uh, helping souls crossover. Uh, it's Nathan, only available right now in the paper book. The Kindle version should be out anytime. And then right. after the first of the year, I hope to do an audible version of it. I'm looking forward to all that. Thank you so much for being on again, Nathan. And again, you can find him at nathan-castle.com. All of his books are there. And he is doing retreats, um, online retreats. And so just go in and take a look. So thanks a lot for being on today, Father Nathan. It was really great to have you again. Always a joy. All right, my friend. Take good care. God bless. God bless you too. 
And to the rest of my audience, I'm wishing you well. I hope wherever you are, you're doing okay. There's a lot going on and you're staying safe and doing everything that you need to do. So I wish you well. I send you many, many blessings and wishing you a great rest of your week. Take care. Bye-bye. We hope you have found hope in this week's edition of Inspiring End-of-Life Conversations. Please join your host, Nina Impala, for another program next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time and 3 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. We'll talk again soon.